Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the International Women's Day Lecture, hosted by the Department of Life Sciences. Um, uh, I'm, uh, <coughs> I'm, my name's Hugh Huberti, one of the academic staff here in the department. And uh, it's really a great pleasure to have uh, Leila Okai, who's the head of the Center for Equality, Diversity, and Inclusion at Imperial, to give um, what you can see is a, a highly unambitious t uh, talk. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how qualified I am to be introducing it, but you know, apart from the fact that, um, well, I only have sisters and I only have daughters, so that's my, that's my qualif qualification. Plus the fact one of my sister's actual birthday is actually International Women's Day, so I did remember to send her a card, so we're, we're okay. Um, over the last, uh, well, uh, Leila has over 14 years experience uh, in the field um, of the very difficult job of, of embedding uh, cultural change related to diversity, equality, and inclusion. And prior to being here at Imperial, she was uh, uh, at Oxford University for over six years. And since she's been here, some of the things she's been involved in uh, is, has been developing Imperial's own uh, disabled and BAME leadership programs. And uh, she's also spoken regularly um, on mental health and well-being in the, in the workplace, and she's delivered various training programs on that, uh, you know, here in, in the higher education sector and also uh, in the private sector. And uh, I think uh, we're all very much looking forward to this very ambitious uh, area and topic that uh, Leila is going to talk to uh, us all about, but um, judging by the, the number of people here and the number of people I know are watching uh, on, on streaming, there's a, a lot of interest uh, in this particular topic. And uh, I'm glad I, we, we probably couldn't get a better person to, to come and speak to us about it. So with that, I shall hand over to Leila. So thank you. Oh, God, that's really loud, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm absolutely honoured to be doing this lecture for the Department of Life Sciences and I'm really thrilled to be asked. So um, when you were walking in, I was thinking it's so much harder when it's people you know, it's actually easier to lecture to strangers. Um, but I very much hope you'll enjoy it and there's going to be a, a little bit of interaction. So the talk is about one size fits all. And when Stephen Curry um, approached me, I thought, well, what title could we have? You know, equality, diversity, we talked about it. Stephen said, I think we need something a bit controversial that's going to get people to sit up and listen. So I hope it does do this. And I think in an era where um, things are very difficult, actually globally, politically, not just in the West, but in the East as well, um, it is about thinking, what does equality mean? It's not just about one size fits all. Okay, so some of you I know well, some of you I don't know so well, but I'd really like to invite you to my house for dinner. And this is what I'm going to cook for you. I'm going to cook lobster bisque, I'm a very good cook by the way, uh, with crab pate on wholemeal crostini. I'm then going to serve up a venison steak with red wine sauce, mashed potato, butter, chives, fresh petit pois and steamed broccoli. And um, the dessert's going to be rich almond and cherry tort served with caramelized hazelnuts, peanuts, almonds with a side of clotted cream. So could I just get a sense, who could eat absolutely everything on this menu? Okay, so, but not everyone. But I've worked really hard on this menu and I've made it really exquisite, I've made it really um, you know, delectable, delightful, made it rich. Um, and who actually can read my menu particularly well? So again, 50-50. So often we do things with very well-meaning intentions and we want to do the right thing and we're trying to do our best, but actually it doesn't, it doesn't sit, suit everyone and it doesn't fit uh, particularly well. So the challenge is really um, what we may perceive as being the best will not suit everyone, as I've just said, and it does go beyond the concept of political correctness. Um, we do have a joke in our team that, you know, we don't want to be seen as the pol uh, political correctness uh, police, the PC brigade, um, but often that's the way it's perceived. And actually, it's not about stopping people doing things. It's about getting people to do things in a more accessible way. So like the menu, I don't want to stop anyone coming to my home for dinner. The size of my house might be an issue, but actually I would want to create something that you could all eat and enjoy. 
Um, it's absolutely fine not to have the answers. You know, I say to people, I have learned a lot about disability over the last six years, but I'm never, ever going to know everything. And I don't see how I could because it's an evolving area. If we think about assistive technology, it's just not possible to know everything. And it's okay to put your hand up and say, I don't really know, I need some guidance. So the second, the final point about advice, guidance and direction, and it's okay, and it's okay to ask for feedback. So what does equality, diversity and inclusion actually mean? Um, again, you know, in the 90s, the term was equal opportunities, it's changed. Uh, you'll see in corporate sector, the term is more diversity and inclusion. Um, I think in the, in the public sector, people feel that why would you lose the equality? And, you know, what does it actually mean? Is equality about treating everyone the same? Um, is di what is diversity? Is it about thinking how we, we work together? Do we work together well? Is diversity part of tolerance? Is tolerance different? Um, I always think is tolerance as a bit of arm's length and acceptance and inclusion is working side by side and how is that happened uh, or how is it happening and actually are they still important today so um, there's a picture there at the bottom of uh, uh, Deborah Humphreys when she was here pro provost for um, education and uh, one of the time to change well-being champions signing the time to change pledge and I think mental health is one of those areas that is very good at bringing equality diversity and inclusion together because anyone from any walk of life from any race disability gender can experience mental ill health so I think it is about going beyond that carrot and stick compliance approach I think there is absolutely a place for it but how do we do it in a way where we're doing it to empower people, to make it fun, to make it alive, to make it interesting? Um, connectivity. So you've often heard the term intersectionality. We're far more than just what we declare. So yes, you know, for me, one of my defining features is being Asian. For someone else, it will be being a woman, even if they're Asian. And how we all choose to see ourselves, and that's really important, and then also the perception that other people have of us. And I've put listening, hearing, and interacting. So I think we can listen, so people can listen. We can run a consultation, we can go, yep, 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 but I'm gonna do this. Or we can really hear, we can really choose to hear people with differing opinions, people with different perspectives, and that's quite different from just listening. So hearing is going that level below. And then really interacting with people. So one of the things around unconscious bias, which I'll touch on later, is we need to expose ourselves to people who are different from us to try and minimise some of our biases that we have. So I'm going to go through a number of protected characteristics and let's talk about what some of the challenges might be in each area. So first of all, if we, if we take age, and this is simplistic, I, I totally acknowledge that, um, but I think it's particularly important and relevant now, um, especially given you know, what's happened with the Brexit vote, how the data's been cut along age, how people have voted. Again, we saw the same with the American elections. It's going to be interesting to see what happens in the French elections, but how the different classifications, so the traditionalists, 65 to 85-year-olds, the baby boomers, 46 to 64-year-olds, Gen X, 30 to 45 year olds and Gen Y 10 to 29 year olds and I think what's very interesting about higher education is you have all those age ranges interacting and mixing together in lots of different facets um, but you know I think the thing is is around powerful conversations that need to happen and um, one of my colleagues Lindsay she did some really interesting focus groups with 50 plus uh, people at Imperial and actually they felt very happy and satisfied and I always think what about our younger staff so thinking about also apprenticeships how that works with long established let's say um, long established people who've been here and the different perspectives and then you throw technology and social media into that and I think it has a role to play um, and I think it can really work to bridge some of those expectations and misunderstandings around age but actually how do we do that in a really cohesive um, and helpful way and how do we break down the barriers so the perception of the Gen Y's of the traditionalists and vice versa. Um, and interestingly, uh, International Women's Day, there was a, a really good article about it was men 65 plus who were more cognizant of the fact that the gender pay gap was a bigger issue and was going to impact on men, women in the future than there was for the Gen Ys, for example. So then some of the perceptions that each group have of each other um, aren't always founded. Okay, disability. So um, these are the 
statistics from the Equality Challenge Unit report. Um, so the disclosure rate in higher education for disability is 4.2%, yet in the general population that's 5.7%, um, and that's the working population, so that's still low. We're looking at between 11 and 14% for the population at large. Um, and often workplaces are not ready to adapt processes to enable the best from their employees. There can often be, and I'm not, I'm not specifically talking about the college, I'm talking UK-wide, perceptions around performance, disability, what does it mean, it, it's costly, it's painful, I don't want to do it, uh, why do I have to do it? And then what, that ha what happens is staff in the workplace hide who they are, they hide their disability, um, and that makes things worse for everyone, and it's exhausting, it's absolutely exhausting thing to do. So again, even though there's been lots of work done, you know, with Disability Rights UK, um, many organisations, Business Disability Forum, it's still very much a journey. So one in five people have a disability, as you'll see in, in my diagrams there. Um, 8.96 million people have some kind of impairment. And again, that's another interesting thing around how people recognise their own disability. And it is absolutely up to the individual, without a doubt. But if someone acquires a hearing impairment and then they start to struggle in their role, how do we facilitate and support that dialogue so they can still stay in their role and there isn't this whole then question mark about performance and capability when actually we've got a really talented member of staff and student, in fact, of course, that we can enable them to stay in the work or study place. Um, and only 17% of people are born with a disability. So the likelihood is with us working longer, if we link it back to age, that we're likely to acquire a disability as we get older. We're likely to acquire that disability in the workplace as well as we get older. So um, I absolutely love this diagram, if anyone's familiar with the Crippen cartoons. Um, and uh, yes, it's about the, so the new disability benefits scheme stroke scam, it's written. And the reason I put this up here is because often processes can be really overcomplicated for disabled staff. So, I mean, this is about benefits, and I, I don't want to focus on benefits specifically, but for example, someone comes in, they have a disability, you disclose, you go here, you go there, referral over here, referral over there, access to work, they come in, another assessment, and it's incredibly exhausting and actually you know that's the process we have and we I think here at the college we've really tried to streamline that and make it more effective for staff but there'll be situations where often any staff could be caught in this whether they move on if they're new um, if people don't have the right information um, and again it causes a lot of disengagement and how and why do we have to make things complicated so the whole one size doesn't fit all approach is it's not the rote process for everyone, but actually having a streamlined process that could work for multiple impairments and disabilities. Okay, gender. So I've got a lot of, of pictures on here um, around 50-50, uh, et cetera, and I'll, I'm going to talk through these. So, you know, gender isn't a women's issue, actually, is it? Because we all have gender. Um, and, you know, how we define that, including gender, queer, non-binary, it's a very big, it's a big spectrum. Um, so, yes, we're trying to achieve 50-50, and Athena Swan's been incredibly useful for that. Um, you know, the college is absolutely done an amazing job and my colleague Rob who is you know done a phenomenal amount of work um, and is very insightful and helpful in the way in which he works with gender um, and gender equality within the college but what's interesting is when I go talk to at other institutions um, sometimes the response I get and from a particular academic at the University of Nottingham she said that she felt Athena Swan was an activity where um, she had she had had to work really hard for a long time in order for her male hod to get the recognition now of course, that will depend on department, on institution, and that probably wasn't the emphasis or the way that she, they wanted her to feel, but that often, you know, certain female academics or certain female staff can feel that way, and actually to be very cognizant of how do we address that, that issue. Again, with the green and the orange men and women, um, you know, we talk about gender pay gap a lot. Uh, in, it's, you know, it's in the news a lot, how do we address that successfully? I um, mean, some of the symbols around men, so it's you know, a, a lone man standing there, a briefcase, a handshake, money, ideas coming out of a man's head, and yet still some of the symbols associated with women could be the home, the cooking, the caring, responsibilities, um, and you know, there's, yes, there's pay there, but actually there's, there's not pay for things that are done in the home. Now, I'm not saying that all women will be responsible for caring and looking after the home, absolutely not, but actually how do we continue to 
to challenge these perceptions around women. So for me, you know, people saying, oh, do you want children? Oh, but you'll change your mind. And actually, would they say that to a man? And I find that very irritating because you don't know why someone might not choose to have children, yet men get asked that question a lot less. Um, and I know everyone in this room will be familiar with that. Um, and then the idea of a woman, you know, she's, she's doing all the caring responsibility, the man's running along the track and she's desperately chasing after him with, her, you know, a heavy load of sort of being the main carer in that cartoon instance. Um, how do we equalise the playing field? How do we think about things differently? And actually often men have caring responsibilities. So again, another example where a male colleague was, was caring for elderly dependents and he was said, it was said to him, well, can't you get someone else from your family to look after your parents? You know, have you got no one female in your family to do that? And actually the impact it had on him. Um, so, you know, again, all these things about perception. And then the top picture in the corner is about ethnicity and gender. And again, I think that this can often be forgotten about. And this is where the one size fits all or doesn't fit all. Um, and interestingly, I was reading another article related to International Women's Day about a professional black woman in the journal, in, as a journalist. And she said she has to be very, very cognizant about highlighting errors. And that when she highlighted an error, she was perceived as angry black woman. She immediately got that label of aggressive black woman and how incredibly painful that was for her. And she was actually just being professional and pointing out an error and being a good journalist. Um, and I think, again, they're, they're very strong perceptions about different cultures. So I remember at university being asked all the time if I was going to have an arranged marriage. Um, now, I'm not saying arranged marriages don't happen in certain communities, but the assumption that that was absolutely my future and my pathway, and wasn't I lucky that I was allowed to go to university when actually that isn't my culture, that isn't my heritage at all. And when you have that on repeat, it's, it's a very... It's a very odd experience and you feel you have to justify yourself and that's quite a difficult place to be put in. But that actually we need to take into account ethnicity and culture and how important it is along with gender and how those gender differences um, will be expressed. And again, around caring responsibilities, around expect cultural expectations in certain cultures um, and not making assumptions. I think that's, that's one of the key ones. And then the gendered language. So that's, you know, it's been talked about quite a lot that, you know, the language that women might use on application forms versus men, but also in meetings, how women might speak 30% of the time, but they're considered to speak 70% of the time, how women may be spoken over in meetings. But also I've got, you know, another scenario from a colleague at LSE who said, you know, I sit in these team meetings and I have to voice my opinion, and she happens to be Asian as well. I have to voice my opinion and I'm the spokesperson for the women and no other women will back me up and then afterwards I'm told good job by the women and all the men just look at me um, sort of stare glare at me across the room because I've spoken but if I don't speak you know I, I'm sitting there bubbling up and dying to say something so again it's also women's expectation of other women um, and how that's perceived and that does play a lot I think into the culture piece as well um, so you know how how do we challenge that effectively and how do we give people a space how do we challenge our own conceptions about that so I just wanted to put this little thing up about women being portrayed in films because popular culture is really important. It does, you know, it pervades into the workplace, um, whether, you know, whether we like it or not, it's kind of what happens. So again, this whole 30% rule, 30% of, uh, speaking, of speaking characters are women. So this is taken from, yeah, sorry, top 500 p films, 2007 to 2012. 28.8% of women were, wore sexually revealing clothing. That compares to only 70% of men. 26.2% uh, of women actors par get partially naked. That compares with 9.4% of men. And 10.7% uh, 10, yeah, 10 of movies featured a balanced cast where half of the characters are female. So again, you know, what's happening in popular culture, it does impact on the workplace, even though we're quite removed from the film industry in some way. I think, you know, these things do permeate through. So gender identity, and I don't know if anyone's seen this yet, the, the, the gender bred person. And it's just to say, yes, we have gender, but we also have gender identity. Um, and this is the gender identity scale. Um, and it's, you know, it's very much on a sliding scale for everyone. So you have your gender identity, your gender expression, uh, your biological sex, and your sexual orientation, and how they all feed together to make this person. Um, so gender expression is how you demonstrate your gender. And again, that will be diff different for everyone um, through the ways you, you act, dress, and behave. Um, your gender identity is in your head how you think about yourself. And again, you know, there's been so much more talk about this in recent years, which is great, um, and more gender-neutral toilets, gender-neutral provision, which is absolutely fantastic. But we have to think about... Uh, 
you know, we, we will make judgments because that's what we do as humans, but how we accept that person for who they are and someone's gender expression and gender identity when they're going through a period of transition or thought about that, um, it's not going to always look straightforward. Um, and, we, you know, just being mindful and aware of that and how we can support that. So, sorry, there's far too much text on this slide, so I'm just going to pick up on a few key points. This is from the BITC, Business in the Communities Race at Work Survey from 2015. And um, so I'm going to go on this and then I'm going to mention the Ruby McGregor Smith report. Um, so just to pick up some key points, that 30% of employees in the UK have witnessed or experienced racial harassment in the workplace. That was in 2015, um, an increase from previous years. And I think, sadly, that figure has increased following the Brexit vote. 55% uh, of BAME employees feel they're a valued member of their team, and that's compared to 71% of white employees. Um, and there were about 9,000 people uh, surveyed as part of this report, so just to give you some context. Um, and UK workplaces are far less comfortable talking about race than they are about age and gender. So 37% think colleagues are comfortable talking about race, compared with 44% um, talking about age and 42% on gender. Um, and then 65% of BAME employees actually enjoy working for their organisations as 4% higher than white employees. Um, and they're more interested in taking part in fast track programmes but don't have the same opportunities. Succession planning is far less likely to, to include BAME employees, um, particularly black Caribbean and Chinese employees, which I think is interesting because actually the British, Chinese and black Caribbean communities are relatively small. Um, and BAME uh, staff like to have a mentor and sponsor um, compared with white employees. So 28%, 15% versus 12% and 6% respectively. So quite a gap there. Um, and I, I, I found this and I wanted to show it here. So uh, this is a, an advert from Lake Ridge Health um, from the Greater Toronto area. Um, so we don't care what's on your head. We just care what's in it. Um, so an interesting advert. And I think, uh, again, interesting because we have a lot of... Uh, Clearly, our medical faculty is huge, um, and adverts like this, and are they relevant? Do we need to have them in the UK? Would there be much purpose? And I suppose it would depend on which part of the UK as well, because you know, it's, not, it's not a homogenous thing. So I just wanted to touch as well on Roads Must Fall, which I think is an incredibly exciting campaign. Um, so it's a global movement to decolonize higher education institutions. Um, it's incredibly pow powerful. It was grassroots led. It started in South Africa. And it's about getting rid of statues um, that symbol symbolize uh, colonization. So the one, the decolonize, um, the Roads Must Fall at Oxford is about getting rid of, rid of Cecil Rhodes statue from Oriel College. Um, and I think it's, it's powerful because it's coming from students who are effectively customers um, and it's received very high level media coverage not all of it positive um, but it's the aim of bringing out institutional racism so going back to the point about UK institution UK sorry UK places of work not being um, that comfortable talking about race this has kind of forced the issue um, and I just think it is very fascinating what can happen and how we have to think about the student experience things that perhaps we don't been there for ages it's the way things were still have a profound impact on people because you know I don't think colonization and imperial imperialism the legacy has actually really gone away in many senses so I'm not going to show this but it's one of my favorite TED talks it's uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's power of a single story um, so I would encourage you to watch it there's a 14 minute version and a three minute version um, and it's all about how we tell ourselves a particular version of events. So she goes on to talk about um, when she went to the States to go to university, one of her roommates was absolutely shocked that she spoke English, she knew how to use a stove. She said, oh, show me your tribal music. And, you know, uh, Chimamanda had um, Mariah Carey and, and the kind of shock, the shock factor around the culture for, for her roommate. Okay, and I think religion and belief is, is a fascinating one. And I think, um, you know, absolutely everyone's free to practice their religion, particularly at the college. But it's what we'd call hard neutrality in the sense that no one really talks about their religion openly, or that's not been my experience. Everyone's free to practice, and I don't feel there's any um, negative repercussions of that. But actually, people keep it quite close to their chest. It's not something that people talk about all the time or... Um, I would say broadcast in a way, whereas I think other places that there may be more space for that. Um, and interestingly in there, there's um, E equals MC squared for science and how that absolutely forms part of people's belief. And it's really, you know, it's really, really very important. Um, but certain religions will, will face more challenges um, and, you know, what that looks like and how do we support that in the workplace. So I also think, you know, the people who are pagan. Um, I've known pagan people to experience a lot of um, just 
discriminate, discrimination assumptions, um, not being able to practice maybe as freely as they would like to, um, certain perceptions about certain religions. I mean, I could, you know, it's a whole other talk, isn't it, talking about Islam in the modern day. Um, but what that looks like and what that feels like to people and how it all integrates together. Um, and you get cases where people will not want to participate in something due to their religious or just their beliefs, whether they're religious or not. And how do you manage that and how you can still manage that within a team? Um, so sexual orientation, um, Stonewall have you know, led, really led, led on this in the, in the workplace, especially in relation to L, L and G, lesbian and, and gay rights and bisexual rights, um, and then transgender rights are just coming into it now. Um, but a lot of work outside Stonewall had been done on transgender. Um, and it's also differing experiences based on class and race. So if we think back to that intersectionality, how it feels different for different people. So, um, you know, brilliantly in our last staff survey, uh, lesbian and gay staff didn't feel there was any negative negative impact of coming out in the workplace, that is phenomenal, really, really great to hear. Um, but then in certain communities, that's going to be very different and people won't feel that they can come out. Um, and also class, class plays a huge issue in, in all of this. Um, and I think the staff networks have played a pivotal role, Imperial 600, in supporting people, um, you know, to get together, to talk to, talk to each other. Um, we have a bisexual and a trans rep, so, you know, things are absolutely moving in the right direction, but I think often the bisexual voice is not understood or it's misunderstood and it's not heard enough. So that's an area of work um, that, that absolutely needs to be done. And again, I think that's UK-wide. And then I've just got a quick diagram really and I don't know how well you can see it but um, just to show again about the intersectionality so it's eating disorders week at the student union um, and a really great email went out to talk about how gay men were particularly uh, there was a lot of eating disorders prevalent in the male gay community and we need to be talking about things like that how we tie it all up especially as a healthcare provider especially as you know a healthcare uh, in, educationalist um, and religion how that impacts into it I've talked about ethnicity sexual identity by age group you know many people come out later in life how that impacts them if they've already you know had a, a kind of a, a heteronormative lifestyle previously and how do we support people in the workplace the economic impacts that could have on people um, and just thinking about it as a much bigger picture and then you've got a diagram there of the percentage of population uh, which is gay lesbian and bisexual around the country um, and these figures are from 2010 so they're slightly out of date but you, you get a sense, you know, London's 2.2 versus, um, you know, East Midlands 1.1%. So, again, how, how we think about the UK-wide picture. Okay, so how can, so one bit of my talk that Stephen Curry really pushed me to do was how can um, the mainstream support change? So I think it is about moving beyond policies and procedures. Yes, we absolutely have to have them, but how do we bring it to life? How do we make it more exciting? How do you bring it into your team, put it on your team meeting agenda so it's not just, oh gosh, someone's ill and they've acquired a disability, let me get the policy out. And like I said, there is absolutely a place for policy, but it's about keeping it live, keeping it talking, um, and you know, being a tempered radical and rocking the boat. So Deborah Myerson, wonderful author, um, she's done a lot of work on this and the, her book Tempered Radical really changed my viewpoint on a lot of things and she talks about people who agitate gently. So it's not about going into an organisation and turning it around overnight, but let's agitate gently. Yeah, let's everyone put pictures of their partners, families on their desks and that might not conform to the norm. Uh, let's think about, I want to wear my hair a certain way, um, I might want a head wrap, actually letting people do that and making it acceptable for people. And by doing these small actions and going against what people perceive as the norm, you're actually making quite a big difference and, and rocking the boat. So she's written another book about rocking the boat and how you can really get into organizations and do that. And I actually, you know, I do think that if everyone does that, if everyone rocks the boat, is a tempered radical, um, we can actually see quite a lot of change because it's those small ripples that ripple out. Um, and I also think something that works really well here is about the whole competition. So we were talking about life sciences being a real beacon and I think by doing that, it gets other departments up and thinking, yes, I'm, I'm gonna do the same. Um, it's absolutely okay to make mistakes. As I said at the beginning, you can't get it all right. And I think it's the whole thing. It reminds me of the um, Benedict Cumberbatch blunder when he uh, referred to black actors as coloured actors, um, which I find a, a term really hard to digest. But then David Oyuelo came back and said, well, actually, his heart's in the right place. I see what he's trying to say. Let's move away from focusing on the negative to what he's actually trying to say. So again, it's okay to make mistakes. It's about asking for help and direction um, when you need it. And there are lots of sources of support. So you know, how can the college help you with this? Um, and I've used the megaphone from the staff survey um, <laughs> publicity. So 
you know, the online equality, diversity and inclusion um, resources, they're absolutely there. And if there's anything you don't feel is there to support you, then we'd love to know about it. Um, the 90 minute equality, diversity and inclusion course, um, plus there's a face to face training for you to bring any issues up, um, any challenges that you've had in a blended learning context. We've got proactive programs to harness talent. So impact, which is imperial, about, imperial positive about cultural talent, which has been nominated for a race for opportunity award. Um, the caliber program and our staff networks. And that's absolutely about hearing people's voices and improving. Um, helping you with any follow-up plans from the staff survey to develop action plans, um, HR support and the um, harassment support contacts and staff supporters. And again, it might not be that you have a big burning issue, but just to chat that, that through with someone, that whole thing about, well, it's okay to make mistakes and asking for support. So what can we do to make it all work then? I think it is about having open, honest and powerful dialogues and not being afraid. Um, and they can be really scary. Uh, but I think you have to do it and to have to say, you know, I don't really understand uh, why you are caring for a, an elderly relative when you're male. This is a bit strange to me. You know, I'd like to know a bit more about this so I can understand and make your life easier. Um, I think it's, again, it, you know, it's just apologising when things go wrong and saying I did it with the best intention. I'm sorry it didn't work out like that. What could we do differently next time? Um, regular consultation and feedback with groups, and that can be within a team meeting context. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, big, large scale consultations all the time because that would be exhausting. But just checking in with people, um, doing what you say you will. I think that's a really key one and making sure that people know what you're going to do as well. Um, and that's very much, you know, the, the framework we have, I suppose. I'm thinking about mental health first aid. You know, you tell someone what you're going to do to help them and you don't do things behind their back. So you build that trust and you're able to get them support and help. Um, I think it's about making equality, diversity and inclusion a strategic aim and not a bolt on. Um, and I always talk about this. Please, you know, my, my big um, thing is don't make it an afterthought. Think about, OK, well, how could this impact certain groups? And I, again, he, there's absolutely help to support you with that. And then you can tweak things as you go along um, and not handing the agenda over. So often I feel like people will be like, oh, yeah, it's EDIC. There it goes. It's over there. But it's really important for every to make it intrinsic for all and to everyone to have a part and be a part of it. So, you know, what about mandatory training? Is it the answer? And I, I just want to end on um, a report by Harvard Business Review that was done um, last year. And after five years, so this was a real shock to me because I am, in theory, a big fan of uh, mandatory training. But when I saw this, my, my thoughts shifted slightly. Um, after five years of mandatory training, a particular uh, investment bank in the US saw 0% return on any shift in progression of uh, black staff. So they saw just 3% of, of black men in 1985, and that rose to 3.3% in 2014. So it's really about getting the majority culture involved and advocating so that we're all advocates. So it goes back to being that tempered radical and rocking that boat um, and empowering managers to make decisions with open reviews um, and really going with it, trying and testing things. And if they don't work out, you try again. You go to um, pilot one, pilot two, phase one, phase two. Um, an unconscious bias, so it's very, it's very fashionable at the moment, um, and it and it is a good tool. And interestingly, in the Ruby McGregor Smith report that's just come out on race, race in the workplace, she advocates that as one of her actions, one of the actions that all organisations should have unconscious bias. I think that's important. I think it's useful, but actually, it needs to go alongside those powerful discussions and being bold. And I think training forms a package of that. Um, and then often we get asked about, well, why do you have these special programs for staff? You know, shouldn't management and development be for everyone? And it absolutely is. But there are times where you do have to create sp safe space for certain groups. And actually what we found is there's higher retention and progression of those staff that do come on those programs. So thank you so much for listening. Um, and I'll hand over back to Hugh if there are any questions. Uh, that was fantastic and uh, a very uh, powerful uh, presentation and making a, making a lot of very, very interesting and relevant points. Um, I don't know if, if there are any, it's very brave of you to take uh, questions. Uh, I don't know if, if anyone here has any questions. I think um, there may be some online questions as well, which, uh, which um, uh, Lena will, will, will give to me. But I, I, let me ask a question to, to start off with, which is I, I see in the audience some undergraduate students as well. And I think some of them might be thinking, where do they fit into all this? Because 
Uh, a lot of the work that you, you talk about is, you know, is about the university staff, about all, yeah. all people working in all different roles. I mean, how, how do you, your role is not necessarily touching undergraduates, but where do they fit into things? Mm -hmm. Well, I think they're absolutely vital. They're, they're quite I mean, central. There's, there's, to no, there's no doubt about that. Um, and I'm, you know, the first thing that comes into my head is around constructive feedback to academics around the learning experience, about inclusive curriculum, um, in terms of the peer support side as well. Um, engaging in dialogue, challenging, being part of the student union initiatives, the liberation campaigns. Um, but I also appreciate that not everyone can do that because it's exhausting. Um, and we have to try and avoid that whole thing of, oh, well, you're from this particular group, so you should be the beacon and the person that, are, that you know, stands up for everyone. But I, again, I think it's those, those things around challenging, around inclusive curriculum, thinking about it. Um, you know, we have amazing projects here that do challenge the status quo. So the thing that springs to mind is the cardboard box that was an incubator. And I think things like that really challenge normal of thinking and, and mainstream stream thoughts about what can be done and what can't be done. Laurence? Oh. Yeah. Laurence, shall I give you this, this, this microphone and then everyone can hear you? So, yeah, Leila, I don't know if it's a secret, but I don't think it is. Uh, unfortunately, you have found a job somewhere else and you're moving up north. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so there was a long time at Imperial or achievement or, or, or several? There's so many things, aren't there? I think um, it's the mental, the, one of the key things is getting all the mental health first aid program off the ground, and I never expected it to be so well received. Um, you know, we did two courses, and Anita Hall was on my very first cohort um, of eight people and one of nine, and then it just snowballed from there. And the way that people have taken on that role, I think all the dyslexia work as well. Um, so getting that process up from nothing to scratch, and now, you know, on March the 22nd, we're going to officially launch the Dyslexia Champions program. Um, yeah, there's, there's, it's, yeah it, there's so much, um, and it, you know, it has been brilliant. I think I've seen a lot of change. I've seen a lot of shifts in different directions. And I, again, I think one of the things is I don't have the, the most, uh, the perfect oversight of every single department and what they do. So I think there's a lot that goes on that I'm, I may not be aware of. Um, but I feel there's a lot more dialogue. I feel people are less afraid to maybe talk about things. Um, yes. OK, another question over here. Hello there. I just wanted to say thank you very much for giving such an informative and beautifully presented lecture. I learned a lot, and I'm, more, I'm new to Imperial College, and I learned a lot about what it's like with the inclusion scene here. So um, I am asking from the perspective of a student organization leader. I've recently become an officer in a student organization, and one thing that this organization would like to do is increase our inclusiveness and diversity. Right now, we're a pretty small club and pretty much all of our members, except for myself, obviously, are young men of European or Asian descent. What are some initiatives that student organizations can use or look into to increase their diversity? Like, any advice for that? Mm, so, yeah, my background is student unions, actually. Um, that was my very first job. Um, so... I think it's some of it, I think, well, this is many years ago, so if I'm telling you things that are, you think that's not going to work anymore, then feel free to ignore it. Um, I think you have to get out there and just go and meet people and go to different um, parts of the college, the university, really graph people, um, maybe do some focus groups. Um, I don't know how, you know, you're probably using social media really effectively, but how can you reach out more? Free food. I know it sounds silly. That's always, always a great win, isn't it? You get people in, you can talk to them, and, it, and then you get people that are perhaps are slightly different, um, gauging your communications in a different way. Um, I don't, unfortunately, I don't think there's a magic wand answer. Um, and I remember when I, I mean, again, it was years ago, it was 2004, three, four, um, setting up a black and student, a black and Asian students forum. And I just went out and, and I mean, I suppose I had the luxury of being from that community, but just went up to talk to people and said, hi, we're actually looking for people to be part of this group. You know, would you join it? And just handed out flyers. Um, I'm not sure how effective that is anymore, um, but thinking about different ways to do things. Could you join with another society and do a joint event, that might work quite well for you. Any, anyone else got any, any questions or comments they want to make? Oh, way, way up at the back. Oh. You couldn't sit down in the front, you had to go all the way. Hi, 
Hello. Um, there are lots of positives clearly to take away from your lecture, um, but also lots of things still to improve on. One thing that I've seen lots of people have a difficult time with is the student counselling service. In the first year, people I know who went through student counselling got counselling within, say, four weeks and then had up to eight sessions. But this year, I've known people who applied for counselling in, like, November and then didn't get any till February and then only got four sessions as like an absolute maximum. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what there is you could like advise to sort of help make improvements in this situation because I don't really think it's very helpful at the moment. It's not really doing much to help people and what, what can we do as students to sort of make an impact on that? Thank you. Um, yeah, I know, I know that Rosie um, Summerhays, who's head of the count counselling service, and Dennis Wright um, uh, oversees the student tutors and um, dean of students, they, have, they, they are aware, and I, I, I think they're working really hard to try and, try and resolve that. Um, I think there are a couple of things around, um, so the student, are you part of the mentality campaign? Um, I've talked to people who've been part of it. But I've not actually done anything actively with it. I've just been to some of the things. Yeah. So um, again, they they ran a really brilliant. They did a really comprehensive survey of students, um, and their survey fed into a mental health steering group that the provost chaired. Um, and I'm also thinking about um, you can you can actually refer through again. Students live in different places, but through your local authority, you can refer yourself um, for therapy um, directly through the, sorry, I'm really losing my words here, directly through your NHS trust. So you can actually self-refer, um, as well as being, my understanding is, as well as being on the, the list for student counselling. Um, but again, I can, I can take, take your comments back. Um, but I think they are, they do, they do know about that. Um, but I would say the mentality campaign, self-referral, and then talking to the student health service to see if there's anywhere else that, that people could be referred to, if they've got links. Um, where students live, because I know the catchment area is quite big. Yeah. Another one up here. Uh, th this is kind of a general question, I think, but um, the current approach for uh, gender and sexual orientation um, seems to be to, not to remove categories, but to increase the number of categories. And I wonder if, if there's any, um, how that relate? You know, there's there's an alternative there, which would be to kind of remove categories and view yeah. everybody as individuals. And is that something that organisations are working on? So, are they removing? Are they working on removing categories or adding categories? Sorry. Uh, well, at the moment, it seems to be increasing the number yeah. of categories, but recognising the categories. And an alternative would be to sort of accept individual differences and not put people into categories. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I understand what you're saying. Um, I think. Yeah. Um, so my personal opinion is I think it's good to have lots of categories simply because it gives people the opportunity to self-identify. So the idea is to move from disclosure to declaration to self-identification. And it may seem like a banal linguistic point, but I think it's much broader than that. Um, and I think it also encourages people to have trust with the organisation. Um, so it may feel like you're putting people into boxes, but at least it's giving people the opportunity to, to self-identify in the way that they want to. And personally, I think it's a good thing, as long as you're using that data well and using it to provide your organisation with intelligent information so then they can address any gaps. Um, but I know that, so for example, uh, Ernst & Young is an example where they, they have LGBTQIA, so queer, uh, intersex and allies. And that seems to work really well for them. So their LGBTQIA group is very big, it's very sizable, it's very active, and it seems to work well. So I also think part of the answer to that question is it depends on the organisation. Okay, thank you very much. Lena, do you have anything you wish, you wish to ask? If, no? Or there are, are there any other questions? Anyone else wants to ask? No? Well, um, 